Thank you. 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 Thank
There's teacher strikes, which are maybe not violent uh, always, but they're very politically sensitive. Um, so, you know, after a couple of years of every time I went to Kenya, oh, sorry, I'm way behind. Um, um, the, um, we tried to get more serious about trying to do something about this, because it seemed very effective. The, the problem is there's a lot of work that's needed to go from, a huge amount of work that's needed to go from saying that something's you know, successful in a trial to having something that can be scaled up. There's a few examples. Like you need maps of where the, where the worms are in Kenya, and you need to uh, translate that into what the school, uh, current school districts are. And you know, that's, that takes a lot of work to do. You need, to, you need a budget. What's it going to cost to do a national program? You need to have that in the right format for the Ministry of Finance. You need to get it in on time. The memo to the people in the Ministry of Education who do finance stuff, then that has to go to the Ministry of Finance. Uh, you need to work out how you're going to uh, schedule. When do you need to get the trainers in to train the people who are going to train the teachers? And, and uh, um, you know, how are you going to handle various procurement issues? There's also a bunch of politics. I say there were no vested interests, but there were very important vested interests, not the teachers' union, but the Ministry of Health people who thought they should be in charge, and the Ministry of Education people who thought they should be in charge. You got to work all that stuff out. And that was, not, that was not happening because it was not in anybody's interest, either within the national government of Kenya or from the international institutions, to put a lot of effort into that. And it didn't take a lot of effort. Um, we basically got, we, we did a couple of things afterwards when we tried to go beyond just the normal dissemination. Got more help from the World Bank and the permanent secretary. They were quite willing to do it. They are quite willing to call a meeting, get all the people in the ministry there who, were needed, who needed to figure out how to do this. We raised some money. We used that money to second staff from the NGO to, uh, to the ministry and to support them. You know, one person seconded, one outside. Reached out to political leaders, gave the political leaders a forum to announce this, because that then motivates it to, to actually happen. Kenya adopted this, um, reaching you know, 5 million children last year. Um, they, that helped get, seeing the example of a country that did this, helped get Indian states to do it. Of course, one, once one Indian state does it, other Indian states pay a lot more attention. It's much easier to get them to pay attention to that than to, uh, to what's going on in Kenya. Now, so Bihar has done this, uh, Rajasthan's doing it, uh, Delhi. Um, there's now 40 million kids who are being dewormed each year through, through, these, through these efforts that came out of this. There's other deworming programs. I would say actually had more success with the politicians, sort of more pro-politician in developing country. These are all like bad guys. I don't want to make any, you know, I'm not saying that they're good guys, but this is an opportunity to cheaply get some, do something useful. Basically, when they heard how cheap it was, then they got interested and thought this was, you know, maybe going to help them politically, I guess. And I'm less, um, the donors, I'm a little bit, you know, less, uh, less excited about. But um, so what to, you know, what to do about this? Um, okay. Um, there's a lot of, often people frame this question as, what should the researchers do? I'll try and finish up. What should the researchers do? I feel like that's not, you know, that's, there are some questions about what we could do. But I feel like many of the things that are often people tell researchers to do are misguided, uh, don't really help that much, and are, are um, maybe hurt the research. I think the main challenge is for policymakers. Love to hear more about what DFID is doing, because I understand they're trying to put more emphasis on, on evidence. Um, my view is that a real problem is the fact that there are silos. And everybody's, uh, you know, for Kenya, for education within Kenya. Um, so it's hard. That excludes some multi-sectoral things. And most important, it excludes com competition among, uh, within the, within, among policymakers for uh, evidence-based things. So I, I would say that having a, a fund which is specifically for evidence-based policy with maybe sub-funds to say, let's take something that worked in 300 schools and let's try and scale that up to a province. Let's measure the impact of it or to a country. And then let's try and take that to other countries to pay for all of these inputs that are necessary to take things for a small, from a small scale to a larger scale and then to disseminate that among other people. I think that could be a very cost-effective use of, of, of resources in trying to bridge this gap. And I think that's ultimately up to policymakers to do. I'm sure there are things 
we researchers can do better as well. I, I thought this was going to be easy. I could just say whatever they said, and they have said such involved and complicated things. Let me try to, to give you my simple view of some of the answers to these questions. On the research front, I would sort of generalize, I guess, from what Michael said, that we know one laptop is nonsense, right? But I think it's more general than that. I think we've found quite systematically that giving things to schools doesn't work very well. If you just go out with your bag full of whatever, it's computers or, or curriculum or lesson plans or blackboards or whatever, it, you're unlikely to have a very general effect. Um, and I think that's how I read most of the evidence that I see. Um, and so looking for the thing that's going to solve the problem of Kenya is not what I would look for. What I do think that the research has said more is that providing incentives gets people to act in very different ways. And as long as you can vector that action in ways that you like, that's good. Um, and I think more thought about which way you want to vector this action is um, I didn't realize that, that we'd gone too far on access versus quality. I thought there were still some issues on quality because what I see is um, I see lots of, of con conditional cash transfers that are pure access and you find in parallel, in general, kids don't learn anything. And that that um, leads me to think that you have to define better what you're going to provide incentives for. So that's why I always come back, not, not to Worms, but to the Girls Scholarship Program in Kenya, which I think is an example which shows very clearly you provide incentives for the things you care about, and you get the things you care about. If you provide incentives for things that you think are on the way to what you care about, they may or may not be what you care about. And so that's um, where I am on that. When we go to more about research and policy and the interactions, um, first, I have these doubts of whether we have anything that scales in the sense that we have any single programs that we want to uniformly put across all of Kenya or all of anything. Um, because what I see is that local capacities and local demands are very different. And part of the scale-up problem is that things don't quite fit to what people are, can do locally. And so if you ask me, how would I design the policy program for Kenya? Keep coming back since that's, that's where you have all this knowledge. Um, I would just define it in terms of coming up with a menu of ideas that might work, allowing a lot of local option on which of this menu they choose with incentives for better performance, and providing support for how local people can fight through the results of trying out their best, best guesses at these things. So I see this in the US, and I'm not sure if it works to developing countries. I've been pushing ideas in the US about not trying to institute any policies, but this sort of menu idea with the idea of a continuous improvement model so that you try to teach states and localities how to learn from what they've done and to filter out the bad stuff and keep the good stuff, which is what we don't do. I don't know if that can fit in developing countries where the capacity is even lower than it is in some of the US places. But if you ask me where I would try to get to, it would be something like, uh, like that that had um, help aid different places to figure out how can you figure out whether this thing is working or not. And, and try to get to a better answer. How do you get a con continuous improvement uh, 
model going. Now, the one thing that I find encouraging about educational policy, I think both in the US and elsewhere, is that there's an increasing demand, in my opinion, for better research evidence, better evidence. I see lots of places where people make suggestions about putting in program X, and somebody else in the political system will ask, well, what's the evidence about program X? And that there's an increasing demand for this evidence that I find to be the most encouraging thing about education policy, as I say, in developed and developing countries, um, that evidence is becoming more important. I think that's a tribute to the fact that the evidence is getting a lot better and that there's a lot more to be learned from the evidence. But um, I think that that's there. Um, I don't know, people who work, I don't actually go out to developing countries at all. And people who work in these countries might know whether it's possible to think of introducing ideas of sort of continuous evaluation, introducing programs in a way that can be evaluated along the way and that can allow for this dynamic adjustment um, that Paul talked about dynamics. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm just, I'm just filibustering because I, I, mean, it, it, I have one idea here, and that is that we um, ought to not think of instituting any programs in some sense. That, that's obviously too, too harsh. extremely challenging. Um, in, in our experience with the early childhood development stuff, although our experience is limited to one way of doing things, mm -hmm. so you know, I can't say that we have uh, you know, experimented with alternatives, yeah. but it seemed to us, and also uh, talking a bit with um, our, um, our important collaborators, Sally Grant and McGregor, it seems that in, in these relatively low infrastructure, low skill environment, you might have to be very prescriptive in order to get things done. And that if you do not, of course, empowering is extremely important. And you know, in some sense, an element of our intervention is an empowerment because you know, we're kind of sure. training local people, we're, uh, you know, we're suggesting an approach, uh, we're getting them to do it. Uh, you know, we even gave them kind of degrees, uh, certifying that we're trained by, uh, by child development specialists to, to do this and, and, and so on. But on the other hand, we also gave them a, a, a very clear recipe of how to do it. And I fear that if one doesn't strike a correct balance between um, being relatively prescriptive of how things have to be done uh, uh, and, and, of course, empowerment, uh, you might end up kind of drifting, both because, you know, what we're suggesting is hard and what, I don't know, uh, you, you need to do in, uh, in Kenyan schools, uh, whatever, is relatively hard on the, on the teaching side. I'm not talking possibly mm -hmm. deworming. Deworming, you just go in and you, and you do it, right, once every six months. But you know, if you want to take, change, you know, teaching approaches. Um, you know, if we if we're too kind of generous, then you know um, it, it it will drift. So, so, so I would agree in, uh, completely, Costas, in, in the sense that I wasn't trying to to eliminate any kinds of programs, and it might be that you want to have some very prescriptive programs, but you might well find that they don't work universally, and that you want to have a, a way that the the person instituting these programs has a way to get out of your very prescriptive programs if it's not working and into something else, or to keep the ones that are working. And so it, it, the continuous improvement kind of idea is not necessarily that you let the lowest level um, unit, the, the shack 
on the side of the building that we call a school make all the decisions. I and mean, that's precisely what I was saying, of talking about autonomy, is that you don't want to let it go all the way, but you want to build in this mechanism to sort of work your way through things that are working and not. Um, yeah, I guess I feel like on this this question, there's clearly the decision rights. I think there's probably huge consensus uh, here that the decision rights should be with the with the, the ultimate decision rights should be with the national government, and we would sort of like to see that being democratically decided. And we don't think that certainly don't think that uh, no, nobody's presumably for a world uh, authority instituting you know forcing countries to do things. And, and the question of what level this should happen within the, um, within the, you know, should this happen at the national level or local level, that's a, a very interesting topic and, and which you, your paper uh, contributes to, but that's probably a decision that depends on all sorts of political things that, that will be worked out within a, within a country. Um, I, I guess I see the question as, for me, an operational question is, what should, uh, for example, if we're, if we're thinking about donors or researchers do. And there I think my reading of the evidence is that on a lot of topics, the results are actually quite similar across contexts. So for example, all the results on access, the price makes a big difference to access. That seems to be quite consistent across settings. The results on curriculum mismatch seem, seem pretty strong, seem to show up in multiple contexts. Obviously, there are a lot of places where this hasn't been done, so I don't want to overstate it. But I'm, I'm actually struck by how much similarity there is on, on, on a lot of those things. I guess there's, I agree that on, uh, as you said, on the impact of pure inputs uh, that are not trying to fix problems with the system. So I feel like there's actually a lot of, com of commonality, more differences probably on some of the incentives and management things, which might be more con specific to a particular context of the way a school system is, school systems are run. So. I don't find, as a researcher, I don't, I don't have any, I would have problems if somebody said I was in charge of, of the Kenyan school system, that's not my job, and, and so on, but as a researcher, I don't have any problem telling the, the permanent secretary, here's my reading of the evidence. So, um, and I feel like donor institutions, they're within their rights to say, we're going to support evidence-based policy, and if Kenya's coming to us with something that looks better than what Tanzania's coming, us with when we think it's more effective, we'll spend our, our money on that. Maybe the World Bank's a little bit different, but certainly a, a bilateral aid agency, I think, uh, should do that. So I, I guess I feel there's not, there's not, when it comes down to the operational things, maybe there's not that much of a, of a problem with it. Thanks. Uh, just a couple of points on, on, on being prescriptive, right? I mean, these are uh, also the same places where, you know, say in India, we have a burgeoning private sector on a lot of uh, new products. Uh, you know, we've cut the cost of cell phones by 300%. We've cut the costs of uh, CAT scans by 3,000%, right? So clearly, there are people who know how to do stuff. Now, this question of do you want to be prescriptive or not, for me, in, the, in this early childhood, at least say when I was working with the Indian government for a year, one of the big questions that always came up was you can be prescriptive on a program for a small time, but if you really want to think about 15 years from now, where have you got to, it might be better to let people make their own mistakes for the first five years and allow for a learning period to develop, right? Uh, where the, the, the equilibrium is therefore changed, right? So my, our biggest problem at the bank in both discussions with government and things is, you know, evidence-based policy seems like a fine way to go. The question is, what evidence, right? Uh, in the sense that, that uh, there has to be a consensus about what constitutes evidence, and that we know is always a huge battle. Um, and a question about who will judge the validity of that evidence, right? And that has been an exceedingly hard thing to, to, to allow for a democratic conversation on. And in most places, that democratic conversation is actually not happening, right? I mean, so, you know, evidence is three people talking about stuff. And in, say, the planning commission in India, you know, like fights all the time about what constitutes evidence and what does not constitute evidence. Um, so I think. 
and those issues are, I think, common to most of the countries we're dealing with, austerity or not, is, you know, what's the evidence? Um, okay, so what, any of the four of you want to say one more thing before I open it up? Yeah, it, it, this question about letting local people make their mistakes, that's fine as long as you have the right incentives for the local people sure. so that they're, exactly. they're moving in the right direction. Exactly. I mean, we've, we've got hundreds of years of people moving in various directions without the incentives for the things we want. 